eventually you get to a KC where these oscillations are sustained. And that's called the ultimate gain, KCU. And then associated with that will be the period of the oscillations, for lack of a better term, called PU. Okay? All right. All right, so great. So you've done this, you crank up the controller gain, you get sustained oscillations, you figure out what that KCU value, the corresponding value is the ultimate period, PU. Okay? All right. So you can see that this is maybe not a great idea um, in practice because to do this in a plant, first of all, this might take a long time, right? You're going to keep cranking it up. And when you do get where you want, you're n everyone hates you, okay, because you, the plant's oscillating around. But it ends up that you can find these values by direct substitution. You remember when I, we did direct substitution, was that last time? And I said one of the nice things about direct substitution is you can not only find the range of controller gains that make the system stable, you can find the, the type of instability. And one type is this oscillatory instability. So when we did, I wonder if I could pull it up real quick, just to refresh your memory. Because this is a very standard problem on homeworks and tests. So let's see where. Okay, I'm talking about this method. So here was the example. So this is the example we focused on. I think it was last time. You did this. So this is your characteristic equation for the closed loop system. You plugged in S equal J omega. And then you got two equations in two unknowns, right? Because you, one, one unknown is the KC. The other unknown is this omega. Okay? And then you solve these two equations. You got these two combinations. Associated with KC equal minus 1 was this omega, which means so what this implies is if you take Kc less than minus 1, you're going to get an, you're going to get an instability that has no oscillation. This is the frequency of the oscillation. 0 means it doesn't have frequency. So if you go less than minus 1, it'll be unstable, but it won't oscillate. It'll be just an exponential instability. But if you go above 12.6, you're going to get oscillatory instability, and that's the, that's the frequency of that instability. That is the ultimate gain. That is the ultimate frequency, which is Remember last time I stumbled over this? So, so uh, if I think this is true, right? Omega equals, t or is it p equal 2 pi omega? I keep dropping the ball on this one. <laughs> who, can help, who can help a professor out here? Love the enthusiasm. OK. Um, let's just say the following, that it's trivial, if you know the formula, to compute the, old, the period from the frequency. Okay. So, so for this problem, this is the ultimate gain, and this can be used to find the ultimate period. So if, if you have a model, which I just said you shouldn't or you may not, but if you did, then you could find this ultimate gain in period um, directly from the model, which is what I showed in this example. But I didn't call it by those terms, but that's the KCU and that's omega U related to PU. Okay. So that was the little statement at the bottom of the slide here. Okay, if you have a model, you can find these things by direct substitution. Okay. Um, in the book, they also show that you can do this without a model. They talk about it very briefly. I don't have a time to talk about it in any detail. But there's a method that's very commonly built now in distributed control systems called uh, relay feedback. And so you can actually put a so-called relay feedback into the system and extract this information automatically without doing, without having a model, number one, and number two, without like causing these wild in, uh, oscillations. So there's a, I'm just saying there's a way to implement this, um, but it's really beyond the scope of time what we have to talk about. All right. So now what we're going to assume is we found these values, KCU and PU, right? So there's a couple of ways we could find them. One is do what I said, make the plant oscillate. Look at the period, and then you got them. Or you could take a model and do direct substitution. But in any case, we'll assume we have them. Okay. Then these are classic. This is one of the most classic papers in all of process control, I guess, uh, is the Ziegler-Nichols tuning parameters. Okay. So if you have the ultimate gain and the ultimate period, it says you can directly tune a PI, a P, a PI, or a PID controller. So it's very simple. If you want just a proportional controller, just take your ultimate gain and cut it in half. That's your controller gain. Okay. If you want a PI controller, um, take, the, take the ultimate gain multiplied times 0.45, and the tau i is that ultimate period divided by 1.2, so on and so forth. Okay? All right. So 
These particular tuning formulas are designed to give something called a one-quarter decay ratio. Do we talk about that? Not really. Okay, so um, is it 11 or something? Yes, okay. So you see this makes for a nice problem because I can give you a model and then you can do direct substitution. You can find the range of controller parameters that make the system stable. You can find the ultimate gain and ultimate period. You can plug them into this formula. You can get PI tuning parameters, so on and so forth. Okay, so these Ziegler-Nichols formulas, which we don't talk about how they're derived, but given the ultimate gain and ultimate period, you can use them, are um, calculated such that the system has a one-quarter decay ratio. What that means is, so here's y, and here's time, okay? And let's say we change the set point, and there's the new set point. I'm not going to be able to draw this to scale, as you might imagine. But a one-quarter decay ratio means that, okay? You remember we defined the decay ratio it was, um, like, the decay ratio is, let's call this one A, and let's call this one B. Okay, the decay ratio is that number B divided by the number A, okay? So it's a measure of how quickly the oscillations damp. For this method, these parameters are designed to give, make this thing one quarter. So in other words, the peak here is one quarter of the peak here, okay? Um, Obviously, I didn't draw it to scale because I drew a decay ratio about one half if you look at my picture. <laughs> but many people consider this to be too oscillatory, okay? So they don't like it. So there are some people, these guys are DuPont people, um, came up with new tuning parameters for PI and PID that are supposed to be improvements on these. They still use the same, right? You still you need the ultimate gain and the ultimate period, but these are alternative formulas you can use for PI and PID. They tend to be less oscillatory. And you can, you can see that, that this is not surprising because, for example, if you take a PI controller, you can see that the gain that they use is, what, three-fifths of the gain here? The gain is quite a bit smaller. That'll make it less oscillatory. And then the tau i is, I think this right, is quite a bit bigger, right? And that'll also tend to make it less oscillatory. So, you know, if I say Ziegler-Nichols tuning parameters, I mean use these formulas, and if I say these guys' names, Bjorn Tirius, and this is Little Leibn. Big Leibn is a professor at Lehigh. Little Leibn is a guy at DuPont, okay? That's his son, all right? That'd be really weird to have two people in your family that were control people, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you want to come over for Thanksgiving? Nah, I don't. <laughs> Maybe not this year. Okay. Um, all right, so again, these are plug and chug kind of uh, formulas here. See, Leibniz and Leibniz, they even write papers together. Great. All right, um, so what's, what's shortcomings of this method? Well, you know, for example, if you're actually going to implement this in a plant, you might imagine this is going to be not easy to do if the system takes a long time to reach steady state. Each time you keep increasing the gain, you've got to wait you know, 12 hours to see if it's a sustained oscillation or something. Could, you could spend weeks trying to do this on the distillation column downstairs. Uh, process is pushed to the limit of stability, which will make you very unhappy, people very unhappy if you're in a plant that's actually making a product or doing something useful because they don't like to see this. You'll be disappointed to know an ultimate gain sometimes doesn't even exist. That's really disappointing when you spend a long time looking for it. So if it's a first order or second order system without a time delay, there is no ultimate gain. Okay. So if the system is really simple, you may not even have one, okay? Um, you're not going to be able to do this if the system is, um, well, it's going to be difficult to do this with systems are integrating. You remember an integrating is like a tank, like a storage tank for fluid, holds inventory. Or if the system's open loop unstable, it means the, the process itself is unstable. Um, because in this case, stability is only achieved for val intermediate values. So if the value is too high or too low, it doesn't work. So it's hard to apply here because you, you'll have a lot of trouble finding that value. Okay. Ah, here's what I said. So you can, you can overcome most of these problems by using this method described in the book. It's called relay auto-tuning. It's very commonly used in process control. Um, it's automated. 
so you can take a controller and do these re so-called relay feedback and get the parameters pretty quickly. Um, and if you're interested in that, you can see the text. OK. All right. So if we want to have other ways to tune controller, let me just make sure what I'm doing here. OK. We can um, do a step test. You remember last time we talked about how to find, well, not last time, a while ago we talked about how to take, find models from a step test. So you, here's your output versus time. You do a change in the input U, you observe what the output does, and then you try to fit a model to it. Okay? And I took this picture from the book, but we learned at that time that we shouldn't use methods that require um, inflection points and tangent lines and things like this, but this is a convenient picture to show what a step response looks like. Okay? All right, so what we can do is find parameters. So let's say we want, I want a transfer function that looks like this. Why? Because if I have that, I can do this, for example. I could use this method, or I could apply direct substitution to this and then get the ultimate gain in period and then do this, okay? So let's say I'm resigned to getting a model now. So I want a model that looks like this, first order plus time delay. And so what I'm going to do is what we already talked about. I'm just repeating it here. You're going to do a step test, and you're going to use the data to find the k, the tau, and the theta. The k, you might recall, is always the same. It's the amount you change the input. Well, it's the amount the output changed divided by the amount you change the input. So here's the amount the output changed. Right? It started here, and it ended up here. That's delta y. The amount the input, the amount you change the input was m, right? You do a step change of magnitude m. So if you divide km by m, k is the process gain, okay? So now you need ways to find the theta and the tau. You might recall we used this method. Let me go back to the slide. You find when the response is 35% complete and 85% complete, and then so right, you say, OK, it went from this value to this value. Th I know, I'm just going to approximate here. This is about 35% complete. That would be T35. And then up here somewhere is 85% complete. That's T85. Um, so you find those two times, and then you use these formulas. This is just repeated. There's nothing new on this slide. Just repeated from the previous lecture. Okay. So then you have the theta using this formula, using those two times. And then you can find the tau using those two times. So you have the k found by this, you have the theta and tau found by this. Now you have first order plus time delay model you can do. You can do all the things I talked about. All right? OK. So everything has shortcomings. All right. So what's the problem with doing this? Um, so you know, I guess it's heartbreak. Well, maybe not heartbreak is a little bit strong. But I tell you a method, then I come back and tell you why you shouldn't do it or why it's bad. <laughs> but this is just truth in advertising, OK? So, Let's say you want to do the step test method. This is very commonly used in industry, okay? But it does have some limitations you have to be aware of. Number one, you're, doing every, you're, you're disabling the controller, right? If you want to change the input, that means you've got to have control of the input. You've got to turn the controller off. That means you're controlling the plant, right? The plant is not being automatically controlled anymore, okay? If the plant were to be unstable, this would be disastrous because you do a step change and then it would, the reactor would explode or something like this. So you can't do this if the system's unstable, clearly. Okay? Um, and people have this question a lot in lab. Okay? So the practical implications is that if you want to do this, let's say you're down in the lab, 401 or 402, and you're told you better get a model to build a controller or something like that. And so you have some input here, U. Maybe it's a flow rate. And then you have some output here, maybe some temperature heat exchange problem. I don't know. Whatever. Okay? This might be the flow of the cold water, and this might be the temperature of the hot water coming out. Okay? So the students will always come to me and say, OK, I guess I need to do a step change. I'm like, yep. They're like, does it matter which one I do? And I'm like, yep. <laughs> and they go, but you never talked about that. I'm like, I did. Uh, October 21st, um, 2014. All right. So, for some, because the system is nonlinear, so if the system were linear, you could do any change in the input U, and it would give, give the same parameters of the controller. Because the system is truly linear, it doesn't matter which direction you go or how far you go. Okay? But this, if the system is not linear, you're going to tend to get different 
parameters for, you know, so what is this? This is a step change where you're going up and it's pretty big, and here's another one where you're going down and it's pretty small. Those will tend to give different parameters of the controller, I mean of the model. Because system's not linear, right? If this was linear, then this, the response for this change would look like this change, except it would just be in the other direction and it would be scaled exactly by the magnitude. So I'm just pointing out here that if the system is nonlinear, which mo all systems are nonlinear, some are just really nonlinear and some aren't, that it's going to be sensitive to how big the step change is and what direction you do. And for every step change, you can get a different set of parameters. Okay? All right. Um, I can do this easily enough, and then we'll stop. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, is the, so the parameters you, you solve for are only good within the range of your step? Right. Good point. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, the question is, so if this, what I said is just true, does that mean the parameters you get are only good within the range of the step that you do? And the answer is yes. Okay. So in other words, the step change that you perform should be within the range you anticipate the controller moving the input around. Right? So if somebody said, OK, I've done this step change. It's pretty big, and it's positive. And then, they, and then they ask me, do you think that's a good model if I do a step change in the negative direction? I'll, I'll say probably not. Okay. So in a plant, I have to admit, in a plant, things are a little more complicated than this. And they tend to build these models using software tools, which I mentioned is available in MATLAB. It's called the System Identification Toolbox. And they'll tend to do lots of steps. You get the idea? They'll do them up and down in different magnitudes. And they'll take all that data and average it together in some way to find the model. Okay, But it's beyond the scope of what we can talk about. That's called plant testing, step testing. and So you usually do more than one, one change. Okay. All right, so real quick here. These are the most co um, common controllers that you're going to tune. These are just some kind of rough guidelines. It's not particularly insightful. but. Flow rate control usually is really easy to do because the process is a control valve. And the control valve is really fast. So that means you can tune a controller to be really fast. Right? How fast you can do control has something to do with how fast the dynamics of the, of the plant are. If it's a flow controller, the plant, the thing that sits inside, is a valve. It moves really quickly. So you can tune a really aggressive controller. Okay? So if you have liquid level control and you don't care if the level gets back, so if you, if you had a tank full of liquid, my argument would be a good set point is 50%, right? Half full. <laughs> so if you want it to be half full, you need a PI controller because you need the integral part to make sure it's half full. If you don't care if it's 25 to 75% full, as long as it's not empty or overflowing, you could just use proportional control because you don't care if it has offset or not. It doesn't make any difference. OK. Um, Gas, is gas pressure is hard to control because the dynamics are complex because it's compressible fluid, unlike uh, incompressible fluid. So you have to be careful about tuning a controller. And you have to be aware that um, you, know, you can get flow instability is much more likely in a compressible flow than an incompressible flow. Um, temperature control, um, typically you would use a PID type controller. This just says you, you never know what to do. That's what this line says. Because temperature control problems be a lot different for different problems. You start getting to more advanced control. So these are the simplest things. Getting So eventually, you might want to do composition control on like a distillation column. Um, and in this case, this will tend to be more difficult because you actually have to measure the composition. That will usually introduce a lot of problems, like delay and sampling. You got to take the sample of the analyzer. It takes time to analyze it. The, you might lose the measurement. The measurement will have a lot more noise than like a flow, flow measurement, so on and so forth. Okay? So anyway, we'll pick it back up there next time.